You are now listening to Changing Lives, a podcast presented by Mount Gilead Full Gospel International Ministries, hosted by co-pastor Elena Robertson. You know, we we you know we've been covering like mental health and um, on the podcast, and uh, co-pastor wanted to definitely get get the perspective of men, and so. Uh, you know, we reached out to Elder, um, you know, wanted to to get some guys that can kind of, um, you know, be vulnerable. And, um, you know, I know we all have, you know, different backgrounds, different different stories, uh, different ages. And so um, I guess, you know, when I really thought about, you know, mental health with men, it's not, even during Mental Health Month, it's not really something that I see a whole lot of. Um you know, I know that it exists. I know that there are certain people who, uh, you know, will put some stuff out about it. But, like, what do you guys feel like the stigma, I mean, the stigma with mental health, you know, uh, as it <clears throat> pertains to men, you know, heads of households? And um, why is it not something that, uh, I guess, is, is it, I guess, the being vulnerable part of it that that makes it, I guess something that's not talked about as much. Is it more of a thing where people may suffer in silence or, um, you know, I guess that's the first thing I thought about is just like what what is the whole, I guess, feeling about it and surrounding, you know, when we say mental health? You know, I, w- I would say just to kind of get this ball rolling that, you know, when I was asked to be on here. Yeah. You know, and I own a mental health agency. Gotcha. And um, <laughs> I went around and just kind of started interviewing some of my employees yeah. who have the title of, they're called QMHPs, and, and that stands for Qualified Mental Health Professionals. Okay. So what, what's said, that? Say that phrase again. It's, a, it's QMHP. QMHP. Okay. It's an acronym for Qualified Mental Health Professionals. Gotcha. Okay. So I went around and started asking them. I'm like, um, what is mental health? And what does mental health mean? And just to kind of get some perspective from their uh, eyes. And uh, I don't know if I have the best employees out there, but <laughs> <laughs> they had a hard time answering the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, then when you throw from a male's perspective in there, this should be a very interesting conversation, yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I would share this, too, that some of the answers that came out is that mental health is a condition um, in the mind um, that is, um, you can kind of say, regulated by um, just psychological, your emotion, as well as your physical. Um, so um, as we kind of have this discussion, um, it was interesting that uh, I got that feedback from professionals who work in the field uh, with individuals. Mm-hmm. Well, when I think about mental health, you know, I go back to my childhood growing up, right? You're always taught to be tough, right? Yeah. You don't cry. You know, you fall down, get up. Mm-hmm. So uh, as a black male, you know, we, we've been taught not to show emotions, you know, not to cry. I mean, the first time I saw a man cry, I was dealing with my great granddad and he was crying, not because somebody died, but he was talking about Jesus. Mm-hmm. So I was like, Okay, what's going on? But then as you grow and uh, start dealing with mental health, you realize that we really need to talk about it uh, and deal with it. Because I I look at it like, uh, you know, the mind is like a computer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you put too much in it, it'll shut down on you, right? So just think about with the cell phones with the new generation. Something happened with that phone, too much data on it. We're going to rush to go get that stuff out. Are you going to start putting the stuff in the trash? You know, same thing with a, with a man, mental health. If you don't download some of that stuff you've been dealing with since childhood, then you're going to end up shutting down, explode, you know, uh, lashing out. So that's the way I look at mental health. We, we have to kind of put some of that stuff in the trash and, you know, deal with it. Yeah, what, are your, what are y'all's ages? 
ages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ain't like that. See, I know, like, I know with, with, with women, you don't really, you know, you don't really ask that question, but y'all was like, oh, like. 62. 62, 62 okay. Uh, 53. 57. Gotcha, okay. So, I, based off of what you're saying, you know, as it pertains to, I guess, whether it's your children or whether it's working, you know, I know all of you guys are, are members here at, at Mount Gilead. Even as it pertains sometimes to working with those younger than you, um, you mentioned like, you know, some of maybe how you were raised, some things you may have to deal with. Um, do y'all have any, you know, I guess situations or moments to where you saw that maybe affecting the interaction with um, a son or a daughter or, you know, just something that you kind of had to, um, that you maybe realize, okay, let me, let me kind of switch or change or, um, you know, do y'all have any, anything that comes off the top that's, that's like that? Yeah. And I, and I well, for me, um, <clears throat> assistant pa- youth pastor is in our family, because we grew up as PKs, we were pastor's kids. Yeah. So we pretty much were under the radar all the time as far as people, <laughs> you know? Gotcha. And so under, under the radar or on the radar? I would say on the radar. Gotcha. Okay. Meaning gotcha. meaning that, you know, like living in a glass house. Gotcha. Is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. So <clears throat> people would, you know, so the way we grew up, we were kind of taught and shielded and kind of conditioned to not take things out of the house or whatever like that. So there were instances where Maybe it might have been like a little paranoia type thing or somebody's talking about this or whatever like that. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that that we experienced. Um, you know, I experienced, I experienced some of that type of thing like that. And I think those types of things are exacerbated by, you know, the whole, for me, the whole historical, um, you know, the, the, the condition by which particularly African Americans deal with this because you know the even in, even in Richmond like VCU MCV and so forth and so on and others as well a lot of medical experimentation you know you read Harriet Washington's book Medical Apartheid and you see where there are just numerous instances of African Americans being experimented on and I'm sure not only African Americans but I'm just making the point that that's something that I can identify with because that's the the world I grew up in and, um, you know, I think a, a, another thing is I think that when you deal with mental health as opposed to physical health, we like to talk about physical health because we feel like we can control it. Mm, with yeah. mental health, we, we don't know what to do with it. We can't see it. We can't touch it. It's not tangible in a sense. So we, we tend to not talk about it because it's easier to dismiss it and hope that it goes away than to try to address it, uh, you know, forthrightly. Got you. Um, I think that's big. I, you know, I definitely can identify identify right. with some of that being a, right. a, a PK myself. Yeah. Um, and I think that's big what you said about, you know, the physical, you know, as yeah. guys, you know, right. we, you know, I probably should do more of, of that, you know, while, I, while I'm still a little bit younger and able to get the results quicker. But um, you say, you know, we can go to the gym, work out. You know, what I'm saying right. work on the physical health. We can see it. We can, mm-hmm. um, we can right. eat right. Measure. You know what I mean. Right. Um, a doctor can, um, you know, it's it's a little bit more tangible. Like a doctor can kind of tell you, this is what I see. This is the blood pressure. This is X Y Z. But like, and I guess part of that is, um, as it pertains to mental health, I guess does it seem less controllable? Would y'all say it just? You know, I know as men of faith, we you know we know that that God is in control. But right. does it seem like something that's a little bit more, I guess, like saying, to where, without like a firm understanding of really what's going on, does it seem like something that is a little bit less um, controllable in that sense? I think I think it was interesting what um, Brother Sprague mentioned about this computer, right? Yeah. And growing up, and um, as a child, you're soaking up everything, right? You're soaking up all the good. You're soaking up all the bad. 
and you're just you're just soaking up everything. <clears throat> and as you grow up, even the things that he mentioned about um, as a little boy, you're told don't cry, that you got to be tough, that um, <clears throat> you know you 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 scrape your your arm or something or, or something like that. Don't be a little baby. You know you know what I'm saying. And then. As I'm sitting here listening, I'm thinking of things that I may have heard, like uh, what's said in this house stays in this house. And what that does is it causes you not to talk to people. It causes Mm -hmm. you to isolate yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the the biggest things with mental health is to isolate yourself and don't talk to anybody. And that's when you open the door, you allow um, the enemy to really attack you and— I just think that was interesting that you said that. And then when you talk about dealing with children, some of those things that you've dealt with, if no one has taught you how to raise a child correctly, um, a lot of those things that are in there comes out. Sometimes it's appropriate, but many times, unfortunately, it's inappropriate because you've never been educated. You've never been taught the right way. Um, And that's why I think when when I think about Scripture, I think about— the Bible said, don't um, neglect the, the coming together of the saints mm-hmm. because we all can support each other. We can talk to each other. We can encourage each other. And I think that's important, man, because, um, and I know I'm going on, but when I look at a person's life, I look at it like a, like a, a clear cylinder, for example. Mm-hmm. And everything that's been poured into that person throughout the years, uh, whether negative or positive, it's in there. Yeah, yeah. And the only way to, 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 to um, I would say, to regulate that or to diffuse that negative is to put more positive in there. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, then that negative will be the, 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 the dominant. Mm-hmm. And that's how you would respond in regards to dealing with children or even your wife, for example. I know we didn't say wife, but yeah. that's, that's huge. I guess that's a big one, huh? Right. <laughs> and, and, and like he was saying, you, you know, as a, as a man, you know, it's automatic pressure put on you because you're supposed to be the head of your household. You have to take care of your family. Wow. You got to raise these kids, right? And so that's pressure in itself. Yeah. And so there's no book, you know, uh, just going to tell you, lay it out with every situation, how you're supposed to, how you're supposed to flow. And the enemy want to make you think you're the only one going through things when you're going through. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. what I found with this mental health piece— uh, with raising my kids and, and with the wife thing, I mean, you, I had to have a mentor. Mm-hmm. You, you see what I'm saying? And then I can, because being the head of the household, I mean, you need somebody to be able to talk to, throw some things off. Because like I said, that, that that's some pressure. You know, you, you got to pay these bills, make sure they're in the right schools and, you know, trying to train them up right. So if you don't have that outlet, mm-hmm. like I said, with that computer, you download, you're not sharing anything. The next thing you know, you isolate it. And like the word said, the enemy want to sift us as wheat, right? Mm-hmm. But as men, we don't communicate with each other. And then, you, like I said, you think you're the only one going through. And that plays on your mind. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? But So it's very important that you have an outlet, that mentor, somebody you can talk to to help you. Hey, man, I'm going through this situation. And then you'll find out, hey, man— Look, this is what I did with my son. Now, it may not be the same situation, but you're getting a little feedback, and then you're like, oh, okay, I thought I was the only one. Mm-hmm. You, you see what I'm saying? And so, and, and, and growing up in my era, I only had one couple. I keep going back to my big mom and big dad that I saw that, you know, loved each other, one running the streets. You, you see what I'm saying? So when you're trying to do this thing the right way, the godly way, it's hard just to find somebody that you can say, okay, I can pull from here, I can pull from there. So when you had that mentor, I always lean on on my mentor, you know. And once again, I always have by having this church. Thank God for this church. <laughs> Amen. Absolutely. <laughs> Man, this church, I mean, the church saved me. Saved me and my family, you know. So, like I said, that mental health thing. And that's that's another thing that we in the mental health field, right? So we're always giving advice. We're telling people, you know, you may want to see this therapy, you may want to do that, but we don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. You, you see what I'm saying? So you helping everybody else, but are you getting the help you need? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And like I said, as men, I mean, you, I, I, I don't even 
you know, we don't talk about seeing a therapist. We, to be honest, we don't even talk about going to make sure we get our, our health in order. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So somebody else can take it. <laughs> I, I keep going. Yeah, I you good. I agree. Yeah, I think that's a big, I was thinking about even, you know, men that I kind of work with at Mentor and yeah. um, here at church. And a big thing I always say is you cannot do this by yourself. And I just keep repeating that over and over again because I don't think that we really even hear that at first. You, you know, you just, for some reason, it's been drilled in us somehow or the other that we, we just do, you know, you just do it by yourself. You just do the best you can by yourself. And it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And once the enemy gets you isolated, then you are no longer, you are totally incapacitated because you you are made to be in relationship. And that's how you solve the problem. You don't solve the problem by doing it yourself. Yeah. Because you don't know what you're dealing with. You only can see that limited part of it. It's like, I think, when Bishop and co-pastor stood back to back. We all remember that. And they talked about how, you know, they needed each other to see what the other couldn't see. And yeah. I think that's—but it's not only true, I don't think, for just husbands and wives, but it's true for us in general. Yeah. That there are things that my friend or, you know, I can see that I can—and so forth and so on. And I think that's—you um, know, we're getting back to that place— but there's a lot of there are a lot of things that I could go into more depth about that I think that we have been trained and taught that way. I think even the educational system has taught us to. I remember one time I was in a seminar, and we had some people come came from Louisiana to train us to uh, to, to 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 put together a church based tutorial program where I was pastoring, and you know they they said, well, go ahead and do thus and so. So everybody started working. I was just kind of sitting there, and I was like. I said, well, can I ask a question? They said, yeah, yeah, okay. I said, well, can we work together or did you want us to do this individually? Oh, oh, you know, you could, you know, but it's it's as though nobody, it, it was like, well, I wonder why I was the only one that thought about, why couldn't we collaborate? <laughs> yeah. Why do we have to do this alone? Nobody had said that, but that was the way, that was the way people understood it. And I think there's so, so many, I guess I would call unspoken cues mm-hmm. as to how people function and relate and interrelate in society. And this is why in communities, and this is why we never, we never talk about certain things because we get to a certain point and skip over that, skip mm-hmm. over that, skip over that, skip over that. And we never have, and we don't have, and we, and we have not developed a language as well to talk about mental health. You know, we have to, you have to, how do you talk about this? And then the other piece to me is how do you connect that apostolically so that you really understand that you cannot do this. It's not only not without another person, but you can't do it without God. Yeah. And that is one of the big things that society has worked at a long time to try to push us away. I remember years before I left the ministry, over 17 years in Danville, and uh, the Massey Can- Cancer Center came. I forget the lady's name now, but she came and she— Called me on the phone. She said, "Well, you know, <laughs> you know, tell me what I'm, I'm here. Tell me what I. How can I? How can I get in the community? How can I work with people?" I said, "Well, you know, you know, you better talk to them about Jesus for real yeah. because they you got to talk to them about something they know. You come from Richmond and they're in Danville and they've been in Danville all their lives. They don't want to hear about that until you, you know, you talk about cancer, whatever treatment. Okay, good, but talk to us about something that someone we know and we can relate to." And so I think that's a big piece now. We're getting back to the place where we're understanding we have to have God in the picture. You know, we have to have that, like Bishop, that earthly representative, who God is in him and then in all of us. And then that's how we connect these issues Mm -hmm. to be able to work on them and not just to kind of deal with principles and skills. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like Brother Banks, I mean, you can have— you know, we do this in our field, same thing with kids in schools, rich in public schools. Yes, you can have skills, but if you don't have the you don't have the spirit of God moving in terms of those skills and those principles you're teaching them. In other words, translation: if you don't love them, if they don't mm. see the love of God. They don't. They, they could care less. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So you have mm-hmm. to have that, and, and that's where we're going. I think is putting this stuff back together and stop operating in isolation. And I'm over here, and you over there. And I'm gonna do this myself. No, you're not. You're not gonna do it by yourself. Wow. I think that's good. I, I thought about uh, my son as you were saying the isolation piece. Mm-hmm. So um, mm-hmm. Danny is two, right? Mm-hmm. And he's always coming home with his shoes on the opposite feet, <laughs> they, just like they like that. Yeah, and and um and I realized like with my wife, with his teacher, he he doesn't want nobody to put him in his car seat. <laughs> he doesn't want nobody to help him put his shoes on. He wants to do it himself. himself. Mm-hmm. Right. And oftentimes it's like, 
your pants are on backwards. <laughs> Everything. Your shirt is backwards. Yeah, you're, you're back. Your shoes are on the wrong feet. <laughs> you know, and and so I think that that there's uh, you know, especially when it comes to men, that there can be sort of a pride mm-hmm. thing. Right. And um and I think that we all have that to defeat. Right. In the sense of sometimes um and I know now nowadays, you know, a lot of people talk about being self-made. Mm-hmm. And even when it pertains to like legacy, you know, um, some people will walk away from legacy because I just want to prove that I can do it by myself. Right. And so I think that that's connected to what you said. Um, the question I would ask based off of, you know, because I think that that's one thing that, you know, we... We do this mental health awareness month and right. we see different things online. Right. And we know that within the church, we definitely, um, you know, Coach Giles said a few weeks back that, you know, God is the ultimate formula for mental health. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. but there's some things that 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 I see out there and I try to um, just remain open so that I can see how people are thinking in order to be able to really help people. And there are a large group of people who feel like the church has contributed to their um, lack of mental health. And so that's a, it's a it was an interesting take that I saw. And, um, you know, um, I, I guess whether it be a, a bad experience or whether it be the, 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 I guess, things may be being taught incorrectly. But in, in this world that we're in now, you know, we know, that you know, God has to be that anchor, right, and I, right. I personally feel like you know we we have a lot of these, like you said, principles and things that we'll put yeah, out there. Yeah, right, but right. it's just kind of like, is it really helping? Yeah. Is it, it, it sounds good, but are you really getting anywhere? Connected, what would you guys say to people who um, may say, "No, nah, well, when I was in church as a young person, um, that gave me bad mental mental health," or I don't know if you guys have dealt with anybody or had an experience that that may have been the case. <laughs> I mean, you like <laughs> I'm laughing because uh been there done it, got the t-shirt, right? Got you. Uh you know, coming up in the church, I end up being at a church where the pastor was was messing around with the women in the church. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh me growing up without my father being in the household, you know, it's certain things that uh, you it really messed me up. Yeah. Because I'm like, okay, I'm at church. I'm doing the right thing. I'm following God. And then the man that's supposed to be leading us, yeah. he's sleeping with all the women in the church. So it really messed me up. But then, you know, when, when, I, when I talked to my uncle, because he's a pastor. Mm-hmm. You know, and he was sharing a story with me because it it, it kind of messed him up. And uh, one of the things that uh, he said that we had to realize who we're following, right? Because he because he went to my big mom, he just knew she was gonna say we leaving, but she was like, I'm not there to serve him. I'm there to serve God. And there's other people in that church that need to see God, so she wasn't leaving, mm-hmm. right? And I was like, whoa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you you know so on the mental side we like let's check out, but then Big Mom was saying we're not there for him we there for God and 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 people need to see the God in them and us basically yeah so that 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 kind of messed me up on the mental side so I I kind of been there done that and I've seen people in the church that that had church hurt you know and and sometimes we just can't get our mind around it. And one thing we had to, I, I remember when I came on Help's Ministry, somebody told me, now you're going to see behind the veil. Mm-hmm. But remember why you're here and why you're serving. Yeah. Don't let these people mess you up. Yeah. Right? Stay focused on who you serve. And so we see a lot of things behind the scene. We have to remember everybody's not perfect. Yeah. You know, everybody, yeah. there's only one person that walked the earth that didn't sin. That's Jesus. Absolutely. So all of us make mistakes. Is you know, we just have to try to forgive. And because of the mental state and how we was brought up, you know, I'm from the projects. So when you said one thing, you got to say what you mean and mean what you said. So when you see people not following the code, you you have the tendency of want to just cut them off. Yeah. But just had to learn that. Got you. Got you. You guys have any well, thing that you've I seen? Or? I think a short answer is 
is preoccupation. We used to call this neurosis or neuroses, plural. Mm-hmm. And to, and and I guess it was a, a wider ter- term than what I'm going to use it for. But I mean, a lot of it to me had to do with 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 the preoccupation of religiosity. This 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 having you know the people. I mean, people really wanted to get it right. They knew the right things to do. You can't sit there. You can't do this. More about can't than could. <laughs> can, but you know, can't do that. And they they knew that stuff cold. But when you take the spirit of God out of that and mm-hmm. love and all what we've been talking about and forgiveness, and you and you and you don't and you don't want to embrace the infilling of the Holy Spirit, see, you have something that is would have been good, but the enemy now has used it for destruction. Yeah, so in a way, up. right? So mm-hmm. in a way, in, in a way, it's almost like a person who's religious, and probably people think this way too. They feel like, man, I would have been better in the street mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because I had a, you know, my mind was a little bit clear about what I, I was doing, what I was doing. Now I'm kind of messed up because I'm halfway here and halfway to, you know somewhere else. And I think that's a big part of the problem. And that's you know again why I love the um, the apostolic because it brings us back to you know, the whole picture as opposed to a part of it. And I think a lot of the stuff that was missing, people, you know, in traditional churches, and that's, I pastored two at different times, one three years and one 17 before coming back to Richmond. And, uh, you know, that that was, I mean, great churches, you know, great people. But th- those were some of the things that I saw where people really just could not embrace the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And it was like taboo or, or anything about... Um, spiritual warfare and demons and spirit that was like mm. you know off off limits didn't want to talk about that and still experience it today you know mm-hmm. going in and out you know people don't want to hear that they just don't want to hear that we don't want to talk about that talk about something else yeah and i've always said that the thing it was the things and i used to preach about this it's the things that we don't want to talk about that we need to talk about these things that we yeah. talked about we already know that <laughs> it's this right, other right. stuff that we don't want to talk about that we really need to start talking about, like today. So I'm glad we're doing it. Yeah. Absolutely. And and one more thing with that mental health. Uh, we was over at Mosby Court, uh, I think it's been two weeks now, two weeks ago. And, you know, when, when we're ministering to the people, you know, uh, you know, some people, you, you tell them, hey, I'm from Mount, boom, shut the door. <laughs> right? Because they, 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 you know, they, they got that stigma of the church. Mm. And then one of the brothers, you know, I was able to talk to him and, uh, one of the things is that with the stigma with the church, you know, we go in, right, and we're not asking the people what they need. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? We're trying to go in and put something on them. And, you know, when you go into the project, you know, we need to go in and kind of first show ourselves friendly and then kind of partner up and kind of figure out what they need. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So they've been hurt by the church because people come in, they say they're going to do X, Y, Z. They mm-hmm. get their photo ops. Get they, mm-hmm. you know, get put on the news and then they out. Yeah. So the people yeah. like, y'all just coming in for another photo op. But mm-hmm. once you be consistent and you keep coming and you keep coming, they say, wait a minute, these people love us. You, you see yeah. what I'm saying? Right. And then you keep talking about Jesus because they ain't heard people talk about Jesus and do something totally different. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but we just have to be consistent, consistent. Just keep on knocking on those doors. Keep going in the community and then they see we for real. Yeah. I love that because... um. You know, the gospel is the good news. Mm-hmm. And um, it was put to me this way. is like, like you said, what, do you, what is it that that you need? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, you know, of course, we know that the gospel is the answer right. to all of all of it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so it's like, you know, what's what's the good news to a sick person? What's the good news to someone who's in poverty? Who's mm-hmm. the, What's the good news to someone whose family isn't together? Mm-hmm. Um, and the gospel answers all of that. But... You know, I think that's big on before you you present it, <laughs> you know, let let me um right. hear from you and see where you're at, mm-hmm. you know, before I'm um, just trying to put that. Um I kind of want to change gears a little bit because I know you you guys are, you know, in, in those fields. Um, thoughts on medication as it pertains to mental health, you know. And I, I don't want to get you guys in trouble or anything <laughs> or anything, but um, you know. <laughs> Um, I just I don't know I don't I don't have a uh, a um, I know my wife has talked about uh, with with her siblings you know growing up they may have had like a, you know like ADHD or some different mm-hmm, things mm-hmm. and they may have been prescribed something um, and then they looked into you know just some practical natural things um, you know cutting out sugar and different things to kind of help 
um, mentally in that aspect. But when it comes to uh, medication, um, what's the playing field like? You know, what's the field like? And what are you you guys' thoughts on that? I would say this it, This is a good conversation because uh, we're talking about mental health, right? Yeah. And uh, we've given a lot of examples of even our own lives, yeah. right? So in other words, we're saying that, hey, we're part of this whole mental health thing right. sure. because, right. you know, the man of God always says what we focus on will expand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that could be anybody that's sitting in the pews next mm-hmm. to you on your row or whoever. Right. Whatever they are focused on could expand, whether positive or negative, right? So when you now you start asking about medications, there's also a piece called mental illness, mm-hmm. right? And mental illness, these folks, um, uh, and Pastor Maxwell, you, you, you uh, okay. probably could correct me on this. These folks are diagnosed, mm-hmm. right? They have a illness. They yes, have a right. something that's 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 that they're dealing with eternally, mm-hmm. right? And um, um, the medication, um, in some cases. Uh, may be beneficial to them, mm-hmm. in my in my opinion. Right. Um, and I will say this, yes. <laughs> um, that uh, my son growing up um, was was having some challenges in school. Um, couldn't sit still, that diagnosis of ADHD. And being in the field, I had to look at it from different lenses. Mm-hmm. You know, um, before him, I would say, well, his behavior has a lot to do with the parents and da, da 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 and all this stuff. But now I'm having to change seats and look at it from okay, this is right next right next to you. Yeah. So how are you going to help him and support him, and so that he can be successful? And um, you have to, as a parent, you have to really look at um, the big picture. Um, am I going to let him continue to struggle, or am I going to? Um, Utilize what's available to support him so that he can have some successes. And um, that's my perspective in, in regards to medications. I don't believe that everybody needs it. I believe that I've seen cases over the years mm-hmm. where people have used medications um, to dope the kids up. So to sp- I use the word yeah. dope, but I mean really mean to numb the kids or. up, to control them. Mm-hmm. I've seen people use medication. Um, parents... I grew up in the projects too, so I'm not. So parents have used put kids on medication so that they can get disability. Mm-hmm. Um, um, right. I've seen yeah. seen people get medication for all kinds of different things. So um, we all know that that um, based on our belief and uh, our spirituality, that um, God has the answer for all of these things. Mm-hmm. But um, People take medication for diabetes. Mm-hmm. People, people take medication for different things. So that's an interesting topic to, uh, to mm-hmm. kind of discuss. Uh, my view on this medication, uh, I would say to the parents, make sure you do your research. Yes. You know, because uh, like he said, a lot of times they just want to put the kid on medication when really you haven't even looked at the situation to, to, to see, okay, if we put them in this program, could, could, could that help him? If we got him a mentor or got her a mentor, would that help? So I said, make sure you do your research. Some kids need medication. Now, I work with some of them, and, I, and, and, you know, some of them need it, but some of them may not need that medication. So if you're thinking about doing it, just make sure you do your research because you can just do some healthy stuff and may not even need that medication. So make sure you're doing your research. Make sure you have uh, someone that's, talking to you and giving you all the information before you just go ahead and put your baby on medication. Got you. To some extent, it goes back to the whole issue of control, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, that <clears throat> because inside of, <clears throat> you know, like school systems and all that, you deal with politics, you deal <laughs> with schools don't want to have children who are, you know, run out the door or endangering themselves or mm-hmm. other children, uh, this kind of thing like that. And so, you know, and so parents, I've seen parents kind of on the other end where they feel like the child is being over mm-hmm. uh, medicated and they're like, well, can't you do something? Can't you do something? You know, and, and so I think you have to, like you said, look at look at all sides of it. There, there are a lot of issues um, that that, but generally, I think that I've seen where I've seen both. I've seen where I've seen students who, who were 
<clears throat> on a lot of medication, almost to the point of not being able to function, right. and just stop. And they, and they more or less did fine. You know, finished school and all that. And I've seen the other two where they, I could tell. I mean, you know, you could see they really needed. If the mother forgot it that day, <laughs> you were having you were going to have a very hard day. So uh, I, th I think it's kind of uh, case by case. For sure. And I, I would even add this to, to that as well, that uh, we're talking about medications who could, that can control certain behaviors. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's also medication for people who are schizophrenic. Psychotropic. Mm -hmm. Or psychotropic mm -hmm. right, medications right, right. who <clears throat> help them to really, you know. Yeah, that's a whole thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, people who are right. seeing things, hallucinating mm -hmm. yeah. and things of that yeah. nature. Um, they need that medication. Right, right. Yeah. right. So... Um, Let's use like depression for an example. Um, at what point should someone look to get diagnosed? Or like, what's, what's your thoughts on, um, you know, someone looking, you know, for a diagnosis or when, when, when does it get to like that place? Or do, is that something that you feel like can be resolved elsewhere? Mm. I'm going to be real quick and I'm going to pass this on. <laughs> I don't think anybody should go looking to get diagnosed. Got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. All right. I think if you need help, right, I think that you should seek help, right? Okay. You should seek the help that you need um, and be very careful. And, and like uh, Brother Sprague said, you should do your research. And um, whoever is directing you should help you out in regards to, because once you get that diagnosis, mm -hmm. that thing follows you um, throughout. So. Mm -hmm. I would just say that piece that don't go looking to be diagnosed. Some people do that as that crutch that I was talking about earlier in regards right. to uh, some of the benefits of things that you can get mm -hmm. from having a diagnosis. That's some of the, the things that people are playing out here um, nowadays, and we, we work in that field. So uh, I would just say that piece real quick. Is that the stigma? Is that the stigma, what you're talking about? Is that when you say... It can, you know, if they, if you, once you get, once you get on it, you're kind of stuck with it. Once you get the diagnosis, you're stuck with it. Is that, are you saying that sort of like becomes a stigma for you as you go through life that you carry that label? Is that what you're kind of saying a little bit? Well, I think that sometimes when you're diagnosed with certain di diagnoses yeah. and you uh, pursue a career, for example, right. that could potentially oh, yeah. come back yeah. to get yeah. you. You know what I mean? And, it's in your file. And, and then sometimes um, okay. working in this industry, yeah. if you came to me for services, let's say your child is having some issues and they really need someone to talk to. I read your file. <laughs> Many counselors in this field will read your file and, ju and prejudge you mm -hmm. based on what's in your file, mm -hmm. all right, before they even give you the chance to, um, to prove otherwise. So um, having to walk through that with the child in schools, that thing follows you from okay. elementary to middle okay. to high school. Right. And they read, it's right. called your social history. history. Yes, they right. read those things. Yeah, they do. And they <laughs> put their little black robe on and that hat, yeah. And they're judging you before you even step foot in right. that. In okay. That. And you and you have to remember the people that that's doing it that's gonna put the late gonna diagnose you, right? Basically they looking from their lenses. So something I may think is not serious based on the way they was raised and what they read, they may say, Okay, this kid has an issue. When really he just need he just need a father fix. Yeah. You, you see? But they'll put they'll put the stamp on you, boom. Yeah. But all he needed was some was a mentor. I guess that plays into some of the the right. physical versus right. mental side because right. physically is a little bit more of a tangible thing. Like we mm -hmm. can see that your arm is broken, or we can yeah. take yeah. X rays. But on that side, it's kind of right one of those. Right. I don't want to say up in the air, but up for interpretation is what is what you're saying mm -hmm. based on who. So as as a if there's like a man out there and um, and he may feel depressed. What you're saying is that he shouldn't go looking for a diagnosis for that, but to seek help. Um, mm -hmm. What does that seeking help look like? I know um, for starters, I know, you know, being a part of a church, um, you guys talked about mentors earlier, but um, when we say seek help, um, what, what all does that entail? Mm -hmm. I would say um, just to, 
put a little piece in here. Um, being a part of the men's ministry at, at Mount Gilead, um, we try to do a good job of reaching out to guys. Now, we, we, we need to do a better job, but we've started— um, and it's not, it hadn't started recently. We've, we've been doing it for a while, but we've started uh, reaching out to guys um, mm-hmm. so that we can draw them in because we understand mm-hmm. that isolation um, opens the door for the enemy. We understand that if you're not connected, then you won't. I mean, you kind of set yourself up to be out there by yourself, but you you won't necessarily I would say reap the full benefits of the ministry if you're out there by yourself, in my opinion. Yeah. Being connected is very important. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. um, depression may not necessarily look like the person sitting over here in the corner isolating himself with his head down. Dude could be depressed. A bishop preached a message. Um, gosh, what was the name of that message? Um, y'all help me. Um <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot of these three of them a week. <laughs> <laughs> At least. At least. So, private pain, I private, think it was. Private, private, private okay. pain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> man, that was a that was a powerful, powerful message in regards to how we are walking around here um in this private pain. Mm-hmm. And um mm-hmm. yeah, let me let me pass with that spray. I mean, but since you brought private pain up, <laughs> I remember we was over at the high school when Bishop ministered that, that private pain. And uh, actually, I think that was the first time my wife ever seen me cry, right? Because I'm sitting there and I'm listening to Bishop and he throwing that word and he's saying private pain. And I'm like, I was going through the things that he was ministering on. And my wife was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? I, I mean, I was crying. I couldn't even, I, I, I was just, just, I'm okay. Just, you, you know, she trying to get the usher and I'm, I'm like, I'm okay. I'm okay. Cause she had never seen me cry. Yeah. And so, uh, I don't know why he brought that private pain up, but <laughs> you, you know, like he said, we can be moving around. Yeah. Active. Busy. But, but then you could be depressed at the same time yeah. and you not even know it. You know, you can, I mean, you can be driving, break down, start crying. You're like, what's going on with me? I'm all right, you know. But that's, that's depression. You, you, you know, you're you, you, you depressed. So, like uh, David was saying, Banks, you can be moving around the church, on Helps Ministry, on the leadership team, doing everything, come getting the three services, and you still can be depressed and not even know it. So, you, I mean, you, you have to, once again, when you're talking to people, Somebody can say, what? Okay, maybe you need to go get checked. You know, go go to your doctor or something. And then you can go to your doctor. They can say, okay, you you this, you that. You may want to go see a psychiatrist. Because sometimes you need that outlet. You see what I'm saying? You can you can get that counselor. Got you. You had anything? Or you... <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm good. Got that's you. Good. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I would say, because, you know, um, I, I even know myself, uh, there's, uh, you know, you talked about crying and your wife was like, you know, what's, <laughs> I ain't never seen yeah, it. Like, how would, right, you know, right, you, right. you got, we're all married. Right. So being vulnerable or being open um, with your spouses or our wives, um, I guess, is that an important part? That that can add something positive to our mental health. Um, I know we talked about maybe sharing things with mentors and um, and and other men, but when it comes to to your spouse, I mean, how vulnerable should you be? And what experiences have you guys had that you know um, maybe could be a good example of that? Hmm. Well. I- I'm thinking maybe to if 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 at all possible to start out start out as early as possible, you know, being vulnerable and mm-hmm. being able to talk at that level. Uh, because as you go along, you may find that the your spouse, your wife, there may be times when you know there are things that you can say, and there's times where you may not want to say it right then. You know, you know what I mean. And so you don't want to burden her with things. Um, you know, but at the same time, you do need to be able to talk about it. So I guess it's kind of a, you know, establish a groundwork for it. And then as you go along, if you um, 
And then there are things that you need to talk to men about. You're not going to be able to, another man, you're not going to be able to yeah. talk to your wife about certain things. And that's just true. Um, you know, and I've, I've had some conversations with my son like that where he'll call me. He's in Norfolk and married, with, you know, three children. And I said, well, he called me up. I said, well, wait, hold it, hold it. You know, <laughs> let's, let's go back. Let's talk about what what this is about and where we need to revisit and remember so that you can have a, a good foundation going forward. Everything can't be. I think that is a problem when we think, I mean, everything cannot, everything can be, let me see. I'm not sure about this, but I'm like Paul said, I didn't get this from God. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but everything can be discussed, but I think not all, it's, it's a time Mm-hmm. element that 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 plays into that. And I think that one of the things that is happening and you see it in society is this this notion, which to me is a false notion or a misled notion of equality, that everybody's the same and everybody this and everybody that. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to have any respect for anybody or anybody over you or honoring anybody. You just say whatever you want to say. You don't have to say good morning. You don't have to do whatever. And I, I think that that's, you know, because it's, we're not taught things about how relationships should really function biblically, you know, and, and just how things should happen because we just kind of like a little bit all over the place. So I think there has to be some discernment as to how to go about uh, speaking with your wife, your children, and so forth. So I know some families, they feel like something happens, then they all just talk together, like the children are on the same levels as the parents, and that's mm-hmm. I believe that's unwise. Um, I think we have to, you know, we have to, certain things are between husband and wife, and then some things— can be then maybe at some later point discussed with the children or maybe not, depending on, you know, kind of a discernment issue. And, and, and I mean, you have to be vulnerable with your wife. I mean, that's your real, right? So uh, you, you have to get in there and, and be able to, uh, like I said, just get naked. I mean, you know, just be able to tell her in and everything. Right. Uh, you know, she need to know you inside out. So mm-hmm. if you're not vulnerable, you having a bad day, she won't know that. Mm-hmm. You know, so you 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 got to get vulnerable, and that's one of the things that being taught as a young man. You know, you don't supposed to let nobody in. You got to be tough, but I mean, once you get your, you know, you, you you're dating, you talking to her. So when yeah. you get married, why you why you not talking then? Right, true. You see what I'm saying? Is is there a certain element though of being vulnerable that we kind of feel like can come back and bite us in a way, um, almost like because uh, sometimes being vulnerable <laughs> shows maybe a sign of weakness. And so is there that thought that maybe that thing will come back up or, well, you know? Well, this is the thing. If you can't be weak with your wife, who can you be weak with? Got you. I, I mean, she got to have your back, you know, and I got to have hers. So uh, if, if you can't be vulnerable with your wife, I mean, why did you marry her? Yeah. I, I, I mean, what God put together, let no man put us under. So, I mean, once you once you say those vows, you all in mm-hmm. I, for me and mine. I mean, we all in. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, you got to be vulnerable. And then uh, another thing, I'm just talking about the men, right? Yeah. Let me go back to the men. Uh, Bishop Minister, when we was in Georgia, uh, about uh, is a spirit of the Antichrist. Is it anti right. like Antichrist like spirit? Well, he don't want that new generation to hook up with the older generation, mm-hmm. and right. So we were seeing that, and so. Uh, Around that time, we was already uh, pl- the men leadership team was planning a sage. Right, we mm-hmm. were talking. We had read this book, and one of the uh, uh, topics in that was talking about this. It, it go from cowboy stage, but it talked about the sages, right? And so uh, we found it uh, a need to be able to try to connect the younger generation. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the 20, 30 and connect them with these sages we have at the church. Because in, in that book, it talked about a sage. When you get to a certain age, they feel like, I'm talking about men with all this wisdom and knowledge. They ain't lived, a, you know, lived a little bit. Yeah. And they feel like it's time for them to go out and feed the geese when really it's that time for them to come back <laughs> and kind of pour into these young men. Because yeah. it take a, you got to see a man to be a man. Yeah. Iron Absolutely. sharp and iron, right. right? And so we have all this wealth of knowledge walking around the church and we're not connecting. And when I said we, I'm talking about me too. And yeah, I'm 53. Yeah. I'm not 20 some, 30 some. And so, uh, and and with a sage, man, they're gonna give you the information. They're gonna, but everything they're giving you, they point you right back to Christ. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So we need that mm-hmm. because, like I said, the kids I work with, 
eighty five percent of them no male in the household. Yeah, yeah. No, no male in the household. So who are they watching to know who they need to be? Mm-hmm. So we need these sages, man. I, I thank God for the leadership mm-hmm. and for Bishop to be able to say, hey, man, okay, we can go ahead and do that. Yeah. So I'm just saying, we we do have these sages around here. We ain't connected. They're going to be they calling their people once, you know, making that connection. So we can't say, I didn't know I could talk to him. Mm-hmm. We, we had said, these are the sages. Let's connect. Make sure you hook up with one. I think that's yeah. important. Yeah, I think that's good. I, I I think that um, oftentimes you know even going back to the isolation piece, and um and and being vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's it's funny how I think um society and the way that you know social media and just media and the way that things kind of are today and in, in, in this day and age have pretty much directly contributed to the whether you want to call it a mental health crisis or, or or whatever, but it's like almost like the way that we're living, and I'm not you know like us, but just we as in society. Society, mm-hmm. you know the um, we look at God's plan for the family, mm-hmm. and we see how society has completely said you know whatever, <laughs> like yeah, you know, do whatever you want to do, do yeah. and then that's kind of directly affected what you're saying with 85 percent of these young men are without a father and um it it's it's almost like it it there's consequences mm-hmm. to it mm-hmm. you know it's not just the uh you know the 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 parents um that that are separated and things that that deal with it but then it's passed down to now the children mentally have to deal with some things that they may not even realize is there and so they get right. into their right. 20s or 30s, <laughs> and then yeah, it's, you know, right. now we know that God provides, mm-hmm. you know, and so, like you said, with sages in this ministry and, you know, um, those around the world that, that watch the podcast, wherever it is that you're at, um, God can identify those people, but, um, you know, it's almost like if we stick with the original plan, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of these issues mm-hmm. w- won't be, That's true. Won't, won't be present. Yes, sir. So... Um, I I think uh, to close, um, I have a a question, um, and it's it's not necessarily a trick question, but <laughs> it's a question that a lot of people may um uh, may ask um, when we talk about having good mental health. Is good mental health happiness? And the meaning mm-hmm. behind that, meaning that, you know, someone who may not necessarily, you know, um, have it defined out what mental health is and all that different stuff, does it simply equate to happiness? Can, can I ask the question? Who defines happiness? I mean, it's like society, like we said, we've been programmed through these commercials, television, video games. Mm-hmm. It's like they put us in a box and say, okay, this is what happiness is. Mm-hmm. Happiness is. So I think... As an individual, you have to decide what's your happiness. I mean, because God gave us dominion, right? <laughs> I mean, and 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 we supposed to occupy till He come back, right? So my thing is, who, why should I let somebody define what is my my mental health, my happiness, right? Because that's that's what society tries to do, put us in that box. So that's that's. I my think it's kind people. of a scary thing too, because when you say that. The thing that comes to my mind is like yoga, <laughs> mm-hmm. and a lot of a lot of um, you know Eastern religions and so forth, so on, and Hinduism and Buddhism and all of this kind of stuff, Confucianism, whatever it is, Shintoism, uh, which is more so Asian, but you know, uh, just s- still not really locked into the God we serve. And that's that's the problem I have with that. People are seeking happiness, but I think it's more than that because happiness is more or less sounds like to me something about self contentment. Mm-hmm. And as we were saying, <clears throat> you know, earlier, and I guess throughout, you know, all of us kind of touched on it. It's really about the relationship. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's not am I, am I, I could be happy, and you could be miserable. Mm-hmm. So I can't use that as a barometer. 
I have to think, you know, I have to think, look at some other things beyond my own happiness. I think that's, it, it's somewhat a dangerous thing because people tend now have gotten to a place where they, you know, like these angel cards, for example, they call them angel cards. They used to be called tarot cards or T-A-R-O-T mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff like that. They, you know, the seance and the crystal ball and all this kind of stuff, reading palms and reading cards or tea leaves or whatever, you know, horoscopes and all this stuff. And I think that, that as, as believers, we have to kind of help people to see that that is not, although it's very popular, very prevalent, it is definitely down the wrong, going down the wrong path, the path of destruction. Yeah. So I would stay away from that term probably. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think when you think about, when when I think about mental health, like I said, it's the spectrum. You know, you got a person who's really struggling um, with, with poor mental health or bad mental health, and then you got a person who's doing very well um, because, you know, the Bible even talks about having the mind of Christ. And if you're doing all the things that, that you need to do for your mental health or, or your mental strength, I think um, the the end result of it could be happiness based on what you what you see as happiness. And I think about um, for an example um, the structure of a family, for example, and 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 you're um, spiritually sound, and you understand that the man is the head of that house, then your wife, and then those kids. And if you're flowing in that vein, and um, and you're understanding um, your role in a family, for example. Um, and and um, you 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 um, you're doing the right things in regards to your finances, and you're doing the right things in regards to your physical health and, and, and your spiritual health. If all of those things are flowing, then at the end of the day, um, that could be a healthy mindset for that particular individual. Got you. I, um, even as you guys were answering, I thought about um, I saw a Kyrie Irving interview. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, with Kyrie, uh, he was part of that 2016 team, the Cavaliers, when they came back 3-1. And um, his mentor was Kobe. And, you know, we all know what type of mindset, you know, Kobe has. And, and, and you know, with Kyrie, for those who, who may not know, Kyrie is a younger player, mm -hmm. probably one of the most mm -hmm. skilled people in the NBA. Mm -hmm. However... Um, he shared that when he was younger, because he won that title, I think, when he was 22, um, mm -hmm. 22 years old, I, I believe, or 22 or 24. He might have been 24 when he when he asked for the trade. But um, he had this desire, you know, almost looking at Kobe as his mentor to, to see what it's like to kind of, you know, maybe um, get to that level. So mm -hmm. he shared like, okay, LeBron came back. Uh, from Miami to to be with with, with the Cavaliers, um, he's a hometown kid. People are, you know, all the attention is on on Bron. Mm -hmm. But what Kyrie did want to do, he he wanted to win a championship. And before that, they were at the bottom of the, you know, he was crossing people, doing all that, mm -hmm. you know. But it takes more than that to win. But um, he shared that, you know, that was kind of like the pinnacle of, you know, what we hear from analysts and everybody, like, got to get to the championship, got to get to the championship. And then we know even the players, we see Shaq messing with Charles Barkley, of <laughs> messing with him about not winning anything, yeah, you know, on TNT. And he shared that, like, he got the championship. Um, you know, he had that big shot. And, you know, he celebrated for a couple weeks. And then it was just kind of like, uh, I thought that was going to be the thing that, that fulfilled that, mm -hmm. you know, right. that void. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Kyrie is someone who probably considers himself, you know, um, you know, spiritual. I don't, I don't know mm -hmm. all the stuff that he's necessarily into. You know, I think we saw him recently saging uh, the arena in, in Boston and different things <laughs> like that. But, like, he kind of just shared and it made, the question made me think <clears throat> about um, how maybe sometimes what, is defined as happiness mm -hmm. or it's like, or, or, you know, maybe it's um, physical things or, you know, the house, that car that you really want. Um, maybe it's an accomplishment, you know, um, you know, getting a business to a certain level or, or whatnot um, and getting there and then realizing that didn't fill the void, right. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. And so right. um, I would say that I agree that, you know, the happiness can definitely be a part or or a result 
of, um, you know, good mental health. But I think that, um, you know, I think what we all have been kind of discussing and kept coming up is just when it comes to God and that having that foundation, you know, that's where, you know, the contentment is, you right. know, that that sense of peace, because I think all that plays a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, even when you look at the fruits of the spirit, you talked about, you know, um, being in line with Christ right. and right. Um, and having the mind of Christ, all those things, you know, peace, joy, mm-hmm. happiness, um, and then, you know, all the rest of the fruits of the spirit are able to flow. So I think, you know, um, you know, for, for those out there who may just think, you know, well, um, I feel happy or I think I'm happy <laughs> and just leaving the mental health there um, mm-hmm. probably isn't good enough. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, right. um, I think that, uh, you know, it definitely has to be, be anchored, um, be anchored in God. I don't know if you guys had anything to, to, to add on to that or any last thoughts. Of... Well, just hope, hopefully, you know, I guess as a pastor, you know, my pr- prayer and heart's desire is that, like Paul said, Israel be saved. But I mean, you know, and meaning in every way, uh, mental health, physical health, delivered from all these things, uh, spirits, demons at every level, and that people would just really seek the help and, and that we would be, you know, every day more available to people because mm-hmm. I'm sure we pass people all the time that, you know, in church or wherever that, that that are dealing with things, and maybe we didn't, maybe we walked by a little too fast. Maybe we just need to, you know, tap them on the shoulder. Hey, how are you today? You know, I mean, little things like that. That's yeah. that's kind of my kind of lives with me. I, I just you know have concerns that we, as well as we're doing, that there's still so much that needs to be done with this. Yeah, it really needs to be done. I just thank God, man, that we that I'm allowed to be a part of this, man, because I'm saying Mount Gilead, period. Because during this pandemic, you know, a lot of churches shut down. Right, right. Right. So now where you had that outlet to go and get the word, yeah. interact with other people. Mm-hmm. Mike, uh, with the same mindset. Yeah. Right? right. Right. A lot of churches didn't have that. You see what I'm saying? And I'm I'm a I, I got to be, I can't be stuck in the house. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I just thank God that we never closed. Yeah. And ha- and mm-hmm. and even to be here to be talking about mental health, you know. So I just thank God for the opportunity, man, and, and, and thank God for Mount Gilead that we didn't shut down and that we are here talking about mental health, especially for the men, because, you know, that's like a, a, a cuss word mm-hmm. when you're dealing with the men, especially black men. Yeah. You know, we don't want to sh- open up, don't want to share anything with anybody. Yeah. And so I think it's important, you know, if you need help, go get mm-hmm. that help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would add to that, I think one of the things that people didn't necessarily realize, um, you know, just maybe being blinded by media and what was being said during that time. I think people now kind of, mm-hmm. in hindsight, are starting to see some things. But, you know, I remember Bishop, he was upset because, uh, you know, it's like, all right, they telling everybody to shut down, but then the ABC store opened <laughs> and right, there's right, right. 40 people in the chandelier aisle at, at Lowe's. <laughs> You know, and different things like that, yeah. and how people have just completely written the church off as pretty much being unimportant mm-hmm. or not. Um, you know, because it, it, people expect us to say that we're a, we're vital, or I forgot the term that people were saying. Essential, um, wasn't it? Essential mm-hmm. businesses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But what people fail to realize is what you just shared—the mental health piece of why we come and assemble together and and stay connected. Um, and of course, there's guidelines and wise ways um, to do that, but I think that was one of the major elements that were missed. Um, and probably, you know, on the opposite end of the spectrum, if the government is deciding we're gonna leave the ABC store open, there obviously was a thought pattern in there of like, all right, well, maybe people need, you know, people might go crazy if they ain't got got that drink. Right. You know what I mean? And so I think that. Um, I think that was something that that, made, that was major that people in that time didn't really see mm-hmm. the church as being essential to mental health. But I think after the conversation we've had today, you know, hopefully that 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 that's realized. Mm-hmm. I, w- I would say this um, and close it for me is that um, I'm 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 eternally grateful for the ministry, 
uh, because that um, I will be honest and say that my business spiked up during COVID yeah. because of mental illness and uh, people reaching out and um, we not closing our doors was vital for, for me and my family. Um, and I would say this is that, you know, Paul talked about it. You know, you can speak in many tongues and all those kind of things. But if you don't love, <laughs> then it means nothing. Mm-hmm. And uh, people don't want to know how much you know. They want to know how much you care for them. And I think that uh, we have the love here, and we're trying to get better at wrapping our hands and our arms around our fellow brothers and sisters. And I think that we can support each other and help us through whatever that comes our way. Got you. Thank you. Well, I mean, uh, I appreciate you guys being a part. I Absolutely. mean, I, I learned yeah. some things. I had some questions where I really wanted <laughs> some answers to. You know, I ain't, I didn't really um, send you guys anything ahead of time as far as I'm going to ask this or, or whatnot. So, um, you know, but th- thank you guys for being vulnerable. Thank you. And answer to the best of your ability. Like you said, it's like, all right, I'm not saying this as as, <laughs> as, as, as Bible, but right, this right, is this right, is how I see right, it. Right. Um, and, you know, God willing, we'll have more opportunities. I think that it's important because it's not just, um, I think what Changing Lives was done, we see comments all the time from people who live all over. Mm-hmm. And people, is, I just found this on YouTube because I searched mental health. Or I, mm-hmm. I found this, yeah. you know, um, we see Bishop's co-pastor's pages on social media. You know, his page went from like 2,000 last year to like, I think it's sitting at 25,000. Wow. Wow. Um, co-pastor went from probably 1,500 to 30-something thousand. Um, mm-hmm. Just So what we're doing um, is impacting hopefully those here, yes. but also people wherever. And I think the conversation that we've had um, mm-hmm. definitely um, – had multiple things in it that should be yeah. a help to, to people from all over. Amen. So um appreciate you guys and and, and thank you for um you know sure. appreciate you. Uh, thank sharing you. your Praise Thursday God. night <laughs> with us. So. Praise God. This has been another episode of Changing Lives. Be sure to subscribe to stay updated on new episodes. Also find us on the web at Mount Gilead F G I M dot org. And follow us on Instagram at Mount Gilead FGIM.